Secrets We Hide by Tiffany Franklin. Now, Tiffany Franklin is not a common poet, so there's not much that is known about her, but a lot of people do like this particular poem, so I'll explain it a little bit, and then Lindsay is going to give you a more generic definition of it, so that way it's a little easier. So, um, The Secrets We Hide, the title can be taken either realistically or metaphorically. Realistically in that it can be a secret that you hide from something. Everybody knows what a secret is. Um, like a surprise party that you don't want someone to know about or where a treasure is with a treasure map. Um, or even if you're trying to hide something that happened and wasn't supposed to. And it can be taken metaphorically in the instance of people trying to hide their problems or hiding a lost love um, or even hiding their real personality. The author seems to know how hiding in our problems can affect us negatively and it can hurt us. And these are bad things that can affect the personality. The poem is at first about how we hide the things in which we keep deep inside of us and it can destroy us by doing that. But she wants us to let it out because we shouldn't keep secrets. Then she switches from telling the reader the side effects and to giving the reader advice such as letting go of some of the bad and telling other people, which is why we have friends. The first nine lines are about how we are all searching for meanings and answers that may depend on us or are even hidden inside of us. The next seven lines are about how we can have both good and bad secrets and even the answers that are hidden in us. And then the last six lines are about how we need to release the bad and tell others our secrets whether it be a lost love or even a gentle secret, and the secrets will become easier to bear. So basically what she said in a really long roundabout way is that <laughs> you struggle with uh, finding your true meaning and how to cope with other people if you keep secrets from them. And by keeping secrets, you tend to not be as happy as a person because you're, you know, you're not sure what to say. And then uh, when you finally come Tiffany Franklin. We struggle to have meaning in this world which we all know. We try, but yet we wonder where we all should go. Hidden in the questions which we cannot find, the answers are all hidden deep inside our minds. Hidden in our souls is the life we try to hide. But in time, it will find you, and it will release all of the secrets hidden beneath. So before it ruins the life you have made, Release those dark secrets and the memories will fade. Hidden in our lives are the stories left untold of the things we didn't want them to know. But once you tell somebody and make your feelings known, the struggle will be over.
it only seems to me to be the proper sphere for a man. And certainly once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes him so very unattractive. Cecily, <coughs> Mama, whose views on education were remarkably strict, has brought me up extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system, so you don't mind me looking at you through my glasses, do you? Oh, no, not at all, but I'm very fond of being looked at. <laughs> you are here on a short visit, I suppose? <laughs> no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also? Oh, no, I have no mother, nor any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I'm Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, it is strange that he has never mentioned that to me. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I'm not sure, however, that this news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know who you are, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a little older than you seem to be and not so alluring in appearance. In fact, may I speak candidly? Pray do. I think that whenever anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were full 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be impossible to him as deception, but even men of the most noblest moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of physical charm of others. Modern, no, less than ancient history supplies us with many perfect examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it's not Mr. Ernest Worthing, who's my guardian. It's his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for quite a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard of any man mentioning his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have loaded a list you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it's not Mr. Ernest Worthington who's your guardian. Quite sure. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon. Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to come up with the comical fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthy and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will be in the morning post on Saturday by the latest. I'm afraid there must be only some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly 10 minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to me, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to let him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you elude me, Miss Caribou, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm glad to say that I've never seen a spade. It's obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Caribou? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills, quite close, you can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in a town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Caribou. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no other idea there were any flowers in the country. Well, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I can't understand how anybody manages to exist in the country. If anybody who is anybody does, the country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. You may offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax. Thank you, detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. 
Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar. And though I asked most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. And I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Paradou, I may go too far, or you may go too far. I am to save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl. There are no lengths to which I will not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such manners. My first impression of people are invariably right. Seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest, my own Ernest. I know there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon. This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh. Here is Ernest. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Caradu. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wrong Gwendolyn. <laughs> I just want to do a little recap on William Shakespeare. Um, undoubtedly, he is one of the most iconic poets, playwriters. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford upon Avon in the year 1564 on April 26th and passed away on April 23rd, 1616, at the age of 52. At the age of 18, he married his wife, Anne Hathaway. They had three children, and throughout this period, he began his professional career as an actor, writer, and part owner of the play that I'm reading to, to you today talks about the King of Navarre and his three lords, Peroni, which I will be reading, Longueville, and <coughs> Dumain. These three have taken an oath to scholarship, which includes fasting and avoiding the contact of women for three years. One day, a Spaniard visiting the king's court tells of a consort named Jaquit Jaquinetta, soliciting in a park. The king gives her sentence, and then the king and his lords go off and to begin their mission. And oh, their mission, their mission and oath. On the way to, to give her sentence, all four men fall in love with women to whom they have either heard about or met. In a small meeting room, Baroni comes to practice his poem for Rosalind, the woman he has met. But then he is interrupted by the king who has come into, into the choir room to practice his poem for his love, the Princess of France. Baroni hides when the king comes in, and the king starts reading. Another lord steps in long ago, who comes in to <clears throat> talk about his poem about the beloved Maria, and the king runs and hides as well. <clears throat> as soon as he begins to start, the last lord, Dumain, comes in and starts to, starts to talk about his love. And as, as he starts talking, Lord Longago begins to scold him about what he's doing. And as he starts talking, the king scolds the both of them for what they are doing. And what I will be reading to you today is pretty much what Baroni, the one who was hiding the longest, says to all of them. Tis more than me. Have at you the most affectionate men at arms. Consider what you, what you first did to swear unto it. To fast, to study, to see no women. Flat treason gain a keen state of youth. Say you can fast, your son is too young. And abstinence and, da and dangerous maladies. And where that you have vowed to study, Lord, and that each of you have forsworn his book, can you still dream and pour and bear on look? For when would you, my Lord, and you, and you, have found the ground of study excellent without the beauty of a woman's face? From woman's eyes, this, doc this doctrine I derive. They are the ground, the books, the academy. From whence doth spring the true Promethean fire. Why are universal plotting poisons up? The nimble spirit in the arteries, as motion and long-bearing action tires. 
the swinging figure of the traveler. Now, for not looking on a woman's face, you have not forsworn the use of eyes and study to the cause of your vow. For where in any author of the world teaches such a beauty as a woman's eye, learning in the adjunct to ourselves, and where we are learning likewise is, then when ourselves we see in a lady's eye, do we not likewise see our learning there? Oh, we have, we, we have made a vow to study, Lords, and in that vow we have forsworn our books. From when would you, my leech, and you, and you, in laden con con contemplation have found out such fiery numbers as prompting eye. Of beauty tutors have enriched you with. Other slow arts entirely keep the brain. And therefore, finding barrier, barren practitioners scarce show a harvest of heavy toil. But love, first learned in ladies' eyes, lives not alone immured in the brain but with the motion of all elements, and gives to every power a double power. Above their function and their offices, it adds a precious scene to the eye, a lover's eye will gaze an eagle's blind. A lover's ear will hear the lowest sound. When the suspicious head of theft is stopped, love's feelings once sent, soft and sensible, then are the tender horns of the clock of snail. Love's tongue proves dainty, bought its gross taste and, and taste. For valor is not love or Hercules. Still climbing in the trees of Hesperides, Hesper subtle as Sphinx, as sweet and musical. As bright Apollo's lute strung with his hair, and when love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. Never durst poet such a pen to write until his ink were tampered with love's sighs. Oh, then his lines would rather savage ears and plant in tyrants mild humility. From women's eyes, this doctrine I derive. They sparkle still, the bright Promethean fire. They are the books, the arts, the academics, that show, contain, and nourish all the world, else none at all in aught proves excellent. Then fools you were these women to forswear. For keeping what is sworn, you will prove fools. For wisdom's sake, a word that all men love, or for love's sake, a word that loves all men. Or women's sake, by whom we men are men. Let us once lose our oaths to find ourselves, or else we lose ourselves to find our oaths. It is religion to be thus forsworn. For charity itself fulfills the law. Who can sever love from charity? Thank you. Nobody twists things around like Shakespeare. <laughs> Feel of his heart. 
You have no right to demand an explanation. Oh, yes, I have. You are part of my life, Bay. Part of me. You talk as if you own me. She was trembling, struggling to get away from him. She couldn't stand her so close to him. Felt a pent up despair inside of her. The anger, the fear of what she knew, not how to tell him. His hands were warm and strong on her back, holding her steady. Then, with one hand, he tilted her head back and made her look into his eyes. You gave me your love. I own that, he said softly. True love involves commitment, vulnerability, trust. Don't you trust me, Faye? New tears ran silently down her cheeks. If I told you, she blurted out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, I wouldn't what? You wouldn't want me anymore. The words were wrenched from her in a blind, agonizing grief. You wouldn't want me anymore. He shook his head incredulously. What makes you think you can make that decision for me? Do you have so little trust in my love for you? They didn't answer. She couldn't. Through a mist of tears, he was nothing but a blur in front of her eyes. What is so terrible that you can't tell me? She shrank inwardly, as if shriveling away in pain. Let me go, she whispered. Please let me go, and then I'll tell you. After a moment's hesitation, Kai released her. They backed away from him, feeling like a terrified animal. She stood with her back against the wall, glad for their support. Her whole body was shaking. She took a deep breath and wiped her face dry with her hand. I'm afraid, she said. Afraid to marry me. Afraid? He looked perplexed. Afraid of what? Of me? Of marriage? They closed her eyes and took in another deep breath. I can't be what you want me to be. We can't have the kind of life that you want. She looked at him, standing only a few feet away. Anguish was tearing through her. I'm so afraid that you'll be disappointed, she whispered. Uh, oh, Faye, he groaned. I love you. He came toward her and panic surged through her as he held her against the wall, his hands reaching out to catch her face. Don't, she whispered, please don't touch me. But it was no use. His mouth came on her and kissed her with a hard kiss of compassion. I love you, he said huskily. I love you. Faith my shirt gave free from his hands. Don't touch me. Please don't touch me. She was sobbing now. Her words barely audible. Her knees gave way and she slid back down along the wall until she crumpled to the floor, her face in her hands. Kai took a step backward, pulling her up. Stand up, Faye, stand up. He held her against the wall and she looked at him, seeing every line in his dark face, the intense blue of his eyes. And this was the moment. There was no going back. Kai knew it too. He held her eyes in unrelenting. Why would I be disappointed, Faye? Why? Her heart was thundering in her ears, and it seemed as if she couldn't breathe, as if she were going to drown. Because, she said, because I can't give you children, because I can't get pregnant, I can't have babies. That's why. Her voice was an agonized cry, torn from the depths of her misery. She yanked down his arms that locked her against the wall and moved away from him. And then she saw his face. It was ashen, gray under his tan. He stared at her as if he had never seen her before. Oh, Faye, his voice was low and harsh. Why didn't you tell me? Why? But Faye heard no more. She ran out the door, snatching her bag off the chair as she went. The only thought in her mind was to get away to get away from Kai and what she saw in his eyes.
before, she just found out that he died, and before he died, he'd been a pretty high-ranking officer in the Army, and uh, she'd been told that he died, and uh, so all her stuff got taken away from her, and she was no longer a student at the house, and she was now a, kind of like a slave to the house. She was their errand girl, and she was basically in rags for uh, since her father died, and I know I am here, and I try not, and I try to be nice. Papa always laughs at me, but I liked it. He thought I was queer, but he liked me to make up things. I, I can't help making up things. If I didn't, I don't believe I could live. I'm sure I couldn't live here. Sometimes I try to pretend it's another kind of place, but the Bastille is easiest, particularly when it is cold. It is a story. Everything's a story. I pretend that my doll, Emily, is a kind of good witch who can protect me. I ask Emily questions and almost feel as if she presently will answer. But she never does. As to answering them, I don't answer very often. I never answer when I can help it. When people are insulting you, there's nothing so good for them as to say a word. Just to look at them and think. When you will not fly into a passion People can tell you are stronger than they are because you are strong enough to hold in your rage and they are not. And they say stupid things they wish they hadn't said afterward. There's nothing so, wrong, so strong as rage except what makes you hold it in. That's stronger. It's a good thing not to answer your enemies. I scarcely ever do. But when I come up to my attic, cold and hungry, I know I shall die presently. I can't bear this. I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm starving to death, and I walked a thousand miles today. And they have done nothing but scold me from morning till until Don't night. Forget, and because I could not find the last thing the cook sent me for, your salad, right? they would not give me my side. Some men laughed at me today because my old shoes made me slip in the mud. I'm covered with mud now, and they laugh. But whatever comes, not alter one thing. If I am a princess in rags and tatters, I can be a princess inside. It would be easy to be a princess if I were dressed in a cloth of gold, but it is a great deal more of a triumph to be one all the time when no one knows it. Sometimes I want to tell Miss Minchin that she doesn't know she is insulting a princess, and that if I choose, I can wave my hand and order her to execution. I only spare her because I am a princess, and she's a poor, stupid, vulgar, unkind old thing, and doesn't know any better. Where, while this thought holds possession of me, I cannot be rude and malicious by the rudeness and malice of those about me. A princess must be polite, even a pretend princess. Sometimes I pretend to be warm when really I'm cold, and sometimes I succeed, and sometimes I don't. But when I do, I'm all right. And what I believe is that we always can, if we practice enough. I've been practicing for a good deal lately. And it's beginning to get easier than it used to be. When things are horrible, just horrible, I think as hard as ever I can of being a princess. For several days, it can rain continuously, and it is really very necessary to make my mind think of something else. And to do this, I pretend I am a princess. Even if I am not one on the outside, I certainly still am a princess, at least on the inside. On the inside, I am always a princess, if only I try. 